Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, series of vodcasts. And this one will be on parenchymal liver disease. This is something I put together uh, for a meeting in December 2019, and I've expanded it. But it's an important topic, and what we're going to look at is basically focus on non-neoplastic processes and really focus on parenchymal liver disease. When you think about parenchymal liver disease, we typically are going to be looking with contrast material. The one caveat would be is if you wanted to know if the patient has focal fatty infiltration of the liver, if you simply do a non-contrast scan and compare the density of the liver and spleen, that's the optimal way. But if we're going to look at the liver in general, and particularly if we're looking for possible tumor, but also evaluating the liver in detail, we'll need both arterial phase and venous phase imaging, typically about 30 seconds arterial and about 60 to 70 seconds venous. It's rare for us to get delayed phase imaging. Occasionally, people speak about that if you're worrying about a cholangiocarcinoma or perhaps if you're trying to classify a mass a little bit better. But for parenchymal liver disease in general, it's not necessary. And again, contrast, we'd like to inject 5 cc's a second, around 100 to 120 ml, depending on patient size. And we will use thin section CT. We always use thin sections. We reconstruct both at 0.75 millimeters and 3 millimeters. 3 millimeters routine viewing. The thin sections are critical for being able to do quality multiplanar and quality 3D imaging. And if you think about the topics we'll discuss today, we'll speak about fatty infiltration of the liver, we'll speak about cirrhosis, Bud Chiari syndrome, a bit about liver abscesses and infarcts, talk a bit about some of the vascular pathologies, and talk about some of the non-neoplastic masses that we will see in parenchymal liver disease. So let's get started. Fatty infiltration of the liver, also well known as hepatic steatosis. It's a sequel of a range of insults to the liver, ranging from dietary to trauma to ischemia. So there are many, many causes. It can be diffuse or can be focal. We know that when it's focal, at times it can simulate a tumor. So it can be somewhat tricky. When you look at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 7 to 10% of patients undergoing liver biopsy have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Obesity is the biggest risk factor for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and as we know, obesity is an epidemic, so we're going to see more and more cases of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Up to 30% of obese patients have it. Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis will become the most common chronic liver disease in 20 years, and at the rate things are going, people predict maybe even sooner. Articles about this, the inflammatory subtype of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH, is becoming the most important cause of chronic liver disease. Now, if we focus on fatty infiltration of the liver, as I mentioned, one of the interesting things is, and we've seen this in patients who uh, have different uh, uh, problems, that you can develop fatty infiltration, or at least segmental fatty infiltration, fairly quickly. The clinical presentations, typical ones, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hepatitis, patients on hyperalimentation, malabsorption, patients on steroids, and on trauma. Now, if you ask the question, how do you define fatty infiltration of the liver on imaging? Typically, we would say that the liver attenuation is lower than the spleen by about 7 to 10 Hounsfield units or lower than the paraspinal muscles. We also can describe if we see the vessels through a zone of fatty liver without distortion, it's fatty infiltration. There are many different definitions, but the one that actually is the most correct and the one that's most reproducible, again, when you use IV contrast, the injection rates affect how the spleen looks, and so you can imagine some of the difficulties. But if you take a liver attenuation of less than 40 Hounsfield units, that is a fatty infiltration of the liver. And this article by Kodama makes the point, non-contrast scans are the best predictor for pathologic fat content. Boise made the point, unenhanced CT represents an objective and non-invasive means for detection of asymptomatic hepatic steatosis. It's better than clinical risk factors because that's really unreliable. So again, a measurement, a number always works well. And a non-contrast CT, you really minimize or eliminate a lot of the variables.
So let's look at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Common cause of chronic liver disease, obesity, 25% develop NASH, which is an inflammatory subtype of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It can progress to cirrhosis, and on imaging, it's impossible to distinguish. This article by Assay, patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, even without metabolic syndrome, and are at a higher risk for atherosclerosis. So it's kind of interesting. People have made the point, including in this article, perhaps we should at least at a minimum do calcium scoring in patients who have fatty infiltration of the liver because of this increased incidence of coronary artery disease. And the fact is that fatty liver is a strong predictor for subclinical coronary artery disease. This article is written a decade ago, and there have been many articles since then that really show this to be the case. Now, I mentioned that fatty liver can develop quickly, patients on hyperalimentation in a matter of days. We also know that chemotherapy-related fatty infiltration of the liver or cash is not uncommon. It can be caused by a number of different drugs, and of course, uh, a combination of poor nutrition, malabsorption, and medication could all be problematic. And so let's look at the liver. Here's a nice example. You can see fatty infiltration of the liver. The patient also has textural change with a prominent caudate lobe. When you look at the numbers and you measure them, I like to use a one centimeter circle. The liver was 18 Hounsfield units, the spleen was 48. And so this is surely fatty infiltration of the liver. Again, we said non-contrast under 40 is fatty infiltration, so that's easy. But also, if the liver is less dense than the spleen by 10 Hounsfield units, we know that's the case as well. Now, sometimes you can be fooled. Let's say, what if the spleen was higher attenuation, like sickle cell, but that's typically not going to be a problem. Now, in terms of imaging, I'll at least comment that patients with fatty infiltration of the liver, when people talk about liver mets being missed, they often mention fatty infiltration of the liver. You can see the lesion by the dome of the right lobe, but sometimes, particularly hypovascular lesions, can be obscured when you have fatty infiltration of the liver. It can be somewhat challenging. In this recent article by NACA, liver metastasis without sufficient contrast enhancement, those in patients with hepatic steatosis, those in subcapsular locations, uh, were more likely to be overlooked. So fatty infiltration of the liver is one of the challenges. Uh, NACA also made the point that it is one of the common causes. Now, one of the other challenges you have, you look at a case like this, the patient has cysts, there's fatty infiltration. Boy, you can imagine why if you have a solitary metastasis, it can easily be overlooked. Now, on the flip side, of course, you could have this case. This patient has what appears to be multiple masses in the liver, but had no known primary. This was eventually biopsied, and this was focal fatty sparing. Sometimes it's triangular, sometimes location. It's easy to make the diagnosis. Here you can understand why we worried about malignancy. You can see, for example, that in this case where the patient does have liver metastasis, how it looks similar to the prior case. You see the multiple lesions in both lobes of the liver. You also see adenopathy. So it's not very tricky in this case that the patient has liver mets, but again, the appearance is different. It almost looks like they're vascular, but this was pancreas, adenocarcinoma, and you can see how you can run into problems. Or in this other case where there are multiple small metastases. So again, fatty infiltration is one of the challenges. Now, one of the other things people mention is there is a specific tumor that does have more than a casual relationship, and that's hepatic adenomas and fatty infiltration of the liver. Hepatic adenomatosis, which is the presence of multiple adenomas, is not uncommon in patients who have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And there have been several reports of this. In this article by Perez Carraris, the coexistence of hepatic adenomatosis and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis has been recently described. And as patients have more incidences of fatty infiltration of the liver, perhaps we're going to see more cases. And if you go back more than a decade, Mike Federley wrote this article. And look at his conclusion. Liver steatosis may play a role in the development of multiple hepatic adenomas. So you can see the question is a chicken and egg phenomena, 
But the point is, if you see fatty infiltration and you see multiple lesions, you should consider hepatic adenomas. And if we see more cases of steatosis, we may see more cases of hepatic adenomatosis. And at least think about that possibility uh, as you go forward. So that becomes very, very important. And here's just a good example. Look at this patient. There are multiple lesions present in the liver. What could this be? Fatty infiltration. Could this be metastasis? You can see it a bit better. And this patient had a prior CT several years early that was negative. And you can imagine why you would worry about METs in this case. But this was simply multiple adenomas on biopsy. And another example here, the same thing. Multiple lesions, non-contrast in the liver. And then here it is with... Um, Cinematic rendering, you can see the lesions very nicely. And again, these were hepatic adenomas, hepatic adenomatosis. So I've now seen a few cases of this. And again, you look at this case, you see metastatic disease. You can think about regenerating nodules perhaps. But again, think about that possibility. You also see in this case very nicely the detail of cinematic rendering showing you the metastasis or in this case, hepatic adenomas. Uh, fatty infiltration of the liver can distort the vessels. Here you can see the vessels weren't distorted, but it's really a very nice way of showing the multiple hepatic lesions that are present. Now, when we talk about low density in the liver, there are other things that can cause it. Acute hepatitis can cause it, fulminant hepatic failure, perhaps Tylenol overdose, disseminate hepatic infection, particularly an immunosuppressed patient, and occasionally lymphoma. So an example, here's acute hepatitis. You can see the patchy edematous changes in the liver, but diffuse low density with some areas of sparing. Or in this case, where it looks like it's left lobe related, and you can see the mass effect, there's a stent in place. This patient had pancreatic cancer and had radiation therapy. So with radiation therapy, often you get focal decreased attenuation, low CT attenuation, sharply marginated along the therapy port. These days with multiple ports for radiation, we see it less frequently than we saw it in the past. Just some facts, radiation hepatitis develops two weeks to four months after radiation therapy. It's a form of veno-occlusive disease, usually has a sharp boundary corresponding to the therapy ports. And the key uh, differential diagnosis is infarction and fatty infiltration of the liver, but it's the unique ports that make the diagnosis fairly simple, as well as the clinical history. So let's now talk a little bit more about cirrhosis. Chronic liver disease characterized by fibrosis, necrosis of the liver parenchyma. Alcohol abuse is the most common cause in the U.S., though as we know there are many causes. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S., and that number is increasing. Beyond alcohol abuse, hepatitis, biliary cirrhosis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, and drug abuse are all common uh, etiologies. In terms of CT findings, nodule liver with increase in size of the left lobe and decrease in the right lobe. We can see increased distance between the abdominal wall and the liver surface. We see nodularity to the liver that will vary with nodules often seen on non-contrast scans as high attenuation densities. And we can see hypervascular nodules on arterial phase imaging, but those are usually hepatomas. We'll talk about regenerating nodules, but that's more common in patients with Bud Chiari, but we'll speak about that in a moment as well. More detail, again, heterogeneous liver texture, surface nodularity, particularly by the left lobe, high density nodules on non-contrast scan, enlarged caudate lobe, segmental hypertrophy of segments two and three, atrophy of segments six, seven, and four, enlarged gallbladder fossa, enlarged periportal space, and peribiliary cysts. So simple examples, nice study here, arterial phase, the nodularity of the left lobe of the liver nicely seen, the widened fissures, this case also makes the point of something we've commented on before. Is there a mass in the stomach? Well, on arterial phase imaging with cirrhotic liver, you want to be very careful about calling masses and calling nodes because if you go to venous phase, you can see everything that looked like a mass is simply large varices. And the varices are indeed impressive and very nicely shown in this example.
Again, uh, on the coronal uh, volume rendered views, very nice visualization of the cirrhosis, large varices gastric fundus, splenal renal shunting, and here it is on the MIP imaging as well. Now, one of the challenges to me in cirrhosis at times, the liver looks really irregular in terms of enhancement. In this case, by the surface of the liver, you know the patient has cirrhosis, but if I'm asking does this patient have tumor, it's kind of hard to say they don't. There are multiple small vascular zones present, there's stretching of the vessels, there's a diffuse nodular type pattern throughout the liver, very nicely seen. And then when you go to the venous phase, you see the large varices in the lower esophagus, you see the textural changes in the liver seen, and one would have to admit it would be impossible to exclude that there's no tumor present. Here it is in the coronal views. So I will say that in patients with cirrhosis at times, particularly when it's diffuse infiltration, it can be hard to exclude underlying malignancy. At times, MR can be helpful in that regard. Here's that same patient with volume rendering showing you the large varices. So one of the challenges severe parenchymal liver disease. And this patient only had parenchymal liver disease. The patient had no tumor. You can see many of the areas of abnormal enhancement, the abnormal appearance in both arterial and venous phase imaging. Another case, here's cirrhosis of the liver, prominent caudate lobe, extensive ascites. You can see there's some compression of the IVC. You can see there's a wet bowel pattern. So things we see with Cirrhotic changes in the liver, we see dilated small bowel loops with edematous uh, folds due to hypoproteinemia. We also can see uh, the uh, thickening of the right colon. When we see colon thickening, we always worry about colitis, but in a patient with liver disease, an isolated right colon thickening, I think it's related to the liver disease and nothing else. You can see in cases like this, in addition to the edema of the bowel, the increased flow into the bowel, this is because of the patient's portal hypertension and increased flow. And we look carefully at the portal vein and SMV to make sure there's no thrombus. You can see in this case good visualization of the portal vein, the splenic vein, and the SMV. And we can look at it with volume rendering or with MIP. But again, it's very, very important to look carefully uh, in this case. Now, another thing to think about, and I mentioned a moment ago, are large varices. Patients could have large varices, and they're not opacified. In this case, even though they're not opacified, you know they're varices because of the tortuosity. But you could see the problem you can have, and it can simulate tumors. It can simulate adenopathy. So again, when you have a cirrhotic patient and you have arterial phase imaging, be very careful not to make the mistake. And you can see here, look at the size of the varices around the esophagus on axial plane, as well as on coronal plane. So very, very nice visualizations of that. And here it is again, looking at it with the 3D reconstructions, particularly the MIP imaging. Now, one of the things I showed you is varices around the esophagus, gastric fundus around the spleen. But you also can see recanalization of the umbilical vein and varices in the abdominal wall or varices tracking to the left lower quadrant or right lower quadrant. And so here's the 3D imaging, very nice visualization of the large varices in the abdominal wall tracking down to the femoral vein. And here it is with volume rendering as well. And here it is with MIP. So you can see that um, a very, very impressive appearance. Now I mentioned with cirrhosis, the presence of a wet bowel pattern. You can see the patient's edematous small bowel and the increased flow. So again, these are things that are not uncommon. I do like the MIP imaging, which shows this very, very nicely. And I mentioned a moment ago how when I only see right colon thickening, I don't really worry because typically it's related to portal hypertension or hypoproteinemia. When the entire colon is involved, then I'm worried about the possibility of uh, pseudomembrous colitis or other type of infectious colitis. Now, a topic that's very important is regenerating nodules, but I think we're going um, a little bit late, so let's just take a break right now and let's come back and talk about regenerating nodules. So I'll see you in a few minutes. Bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store.
All links are in the description box below.